Hey guys, Mr. Davis here. So today what I'm going to be doing is introducing the concept of ecological succession. Um, this is going to be the process by which a ecological community goes from where it starts to a finished uh, climax biome. All right. So how do you go from perhaps an area where you just have some cleared land all the way up to, let's say, a deciduous uh, forest? All right. So we're going to take a look at that today. And so keep in mind that this is going to be a little different for every biome. So I'm going to try and keep it as general as I can. Um, but uh, a lot of times the stuff that you'll find on ecological succession will be kind of formatted to talk about deciduous forests because the original research for this was largely done on those types of forests. But with that in mind, let's take a look. So ecological succession is studied as a way that we look at ecosystems because they're constantly changing. Um, it's a gradual process of change and replacement in the types of species in a community. So you may start out with um, just some grasses and then maybe some shrubs and eventually they'll grow to bigger and bigger trees. And you can see this if you're looking at a forest that's just recently been planted. So you may start out with some low lying things and trees start out as, you know, seeds. They start small and they have to get bigger. Well, it's not just those trees that are growing, but the organisms that are going to live in there because larger trees can support maybe more species of birds and all kinds of things like that. So what you get is a constant change of the entire ecosystem. As a new ecosystem arises, as a new community arises though, it oftentimes will though push out some of the other species. So let's take a look at how this happens. So here's the thing you can start out with something that's just barren land. And this is a picture from one of the calderas, so one of the insides of uh, one of the volcanoes at Volcano National Park in Hawaii. Now, this is one of the inactive calderas, so there's not active eruptions there or anything along those lines. And if you take a look at that, you see that white stripe there? Well, that's actually a road, sort of. It's a path that has been laid down for driving vehicles through. This is a pretty big, just empty area. It looks like the surface of the moon, but literally less than a hundred yards away where there hasn't been a lava flow for probably a thousand years, it looks like this. You have this lush forest, and this is literally a tropical rainforest. So how do you go from that dead, empty, barren landscape that looks like another planet, like somewhere you would test a rover before sending it to Mars, which they do, uh, to this lush, beautiful, vibrant, tropical forest that was literally used for making movies like Jurassic Park because it looks like a prehistoric wilderness. So how do you do that? Well, it all starts with a process called primary succession. And what I've got right next to me here are a couple of different species that aid in this primary succession. So let's take a look at that. Primary succession is the type of succession that happens when you have no ecosystem that started out beforehand. It begins in an area that previously did not support any life. Like for example, uh, new islands created by volcanic eruptions or areas exposed with a glacier retreat or any other surface that has not previously supported life. This is because there's no soil. All right, so all you have are bare rocks. And if you look over here, what you can see are two types of plants that can live on bare rocks. The farthest picture over, that's something called lichen. And lichen is a weird symbiotic life form that is both fungus and plant. It's actually a plant that has fungus that live inside of it and extend their little hyphae down. And lichen is especially interesting because they can grow in dry places and they 
exude or they put out chemicals that can actually dissolve rock and extract nutrients directly from them. A lot of times this is things like phosphorus. If you remember the phosphorus cycle from my last video, um, it might be some nitrogen compounds or maybe even some sulfur compounds and several other things that are necessary for life, which is why lichens grow well on volcanic rocks. Another kind, which is the picture immediately next to me, those are mosses. Now, mosses are another type of plant that can grow on barren rock, but they require a little bit more water. They photosynthesize a bit and they can absorb carbon directly from the atmosphere and build their tissues up from that. And they can grow in the tiniest of crevices as a result. Sometimes they'll both grow on similar surfaces and they'll kind of compete with one another. But a pioneer species is any species that can grow in an uninhabited area that starts an ecological cycle where other species may become established. So um, previously, what I just showed you, the previous two pictures, those were lichens and mosses, those were pioneer species. But in some cases, this can be grasses as well. Once the pioneer species have done their job and there's a little bit of soil built up, you can get some early grasses, all right? And so what I've got next to me now, well, that's a crack in concrete. That's just a little tiny bit of soil that's built up there. And once those first species colonize that bare rock and start to build up that first tiny layer of, of organic matter, as they die and they fill in those crevices, that becomes the first soil that first grasses like those next to me, like dandelions. Yeah, dandelions are actually a type of second pioneer species, if you will, all right? They can grow in those small amounts of soil that are available, and then they can begin to produce more soil and they'll break up that rock even further. The growth of lichens breaks down that rock, which helps form the first soils. Then there's another type of succession. It's called secondary succession. And secondary succession occurs on a surface where an ecosystem has previously existed. It's the process by which one community replaces another community that has been partially or totally destroyed. However, here's the key thing with secondary succession. It's not starting from bare rock. It's starting from bare soil. So the soil's already there, all right? And so the picture I've got over there, that's a picture of plants regrowing after a fire. Secondary succession occurs in ecosystems that have been disturbed by humans, by animals, or by natural processes, such as storms, floods, earthquakes, or again, forest fire, all right? When that ecosystem has been destroyed and you've removed the dominant plant species there, this succession process starts over and you go from bare soil back up to a climax community. And now what is a climax community? Well, that's the community at the end. So what's a climax community? So a climax community is the final stable community in equilibrium with the environment. So right over here, what I've got as a picture of is an oak forest. Um, the oak forest in this state is essentially what it's going to be. And this can actually develop into something even called an old growth forest. Um, it's not just oak forests. There can be a lot of different climax communities. But the idea here is that the mixture of species that you have here, if left undisturbed, it's going to be the same forever. So it may change in small ways, but it's not really going to massively shift. It's not going to, you know, become a grassland or anything like that. It's going to stay what it is. Now, like I said, there's a lot of different things that a climax community can be. So that can be something here in Arizona like, boom. How about a saguaro forest? Yeah, see, those saguaros take a very, very, very long time to grow. They can't land on barren rock and just start growing. What they need is they need the kind of soil that's developed from first having grasses and then some of the shrubs and some of the trees uh, that we get here in the desert. And then eventually you do get the buds of the small, little, tiny, 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 tiny little uh, saguaros. After a year, they're only about as big as the thumb, actually. Yeah, they, they only grow about that big in one year. However, you give them about 70 years or so, they'll be grown up to a full height, they'll start putting out arms, and they can live easily 200 years or more. This right here, where you can see a large number of saguaros with multiple arms at multiple stages of their life cycle, you see some small ones over there that haven't put out any arms yet, and you got all the shrubs that are around there, everything like that, that's a climax community. So yeah, when you guys look out in the desert and you see that, you know, uh, expanse of saguaros and stuff like that, 
that is an excellent example of what the climax community of the desert biome that we live in looks like. And this is essentially where we've gotten to here. So um, this is a picture actually down near Tucson where, you know, it's a high desert, high temperate desert, and this is the kind of thing that you get. All right, so the next thing I wanna mention is something called old field succession. And it is a type of secondary succession. So take a look right next to me again, and you see the big spooky, you know, you know, Hills Have Eyes barn looking thing going on there that looks like something out of a Halloween horror movie kind of deal. All right, well, this is actually going to help me explain Old Field Succession. This is gonna sound weird, but let's, let's stick with this for a second. So Old Field Succession is a type of secondary succession succession that happens when farmland is abandoned. So this thing here looks like a random shack built out in the middle of nowhere. That's actually an old barn that used to be out in the middle of a field. Yeah, this was a field, you know, 150 years ago with a barn in it. And now everything is gone except for this one structure that's managed to survive. So when the farmer stops cultivating the field, grasses and weeds will quickly grow and cover that abandoned field. After the grasses and weeds, then you'll get some shrubs and some bushes, maybe some sapling trees, and eventually you get bigger and bigger trees that'll grow, and by the end, you end up with another climax community. Back to where it was. This is nature reclaiming itself. Over time, taller grasses, perennial grasses, shrubs, and trees will take over this area, and there's a whole chunk of land all up and down the East Coast where you had farms that were started 150 to 200 years ago, around the same time, you know, that the first colonists were clearing land and stuff like that. Those farms failed or, you know, people moved on or moved to cities or any number of things could have happened. And these places have been retaken. And this is one such case. So this is in upstate New York. And this is a result of an old farm community that was abandoned because the farm stopped producing or you know industry moved on or there weren't roads or whatever happened and this right here this barn is what's left of what was once somebody's farm and now it's been retaken by the native species of pine trees that you have there these lodgepole pines have retaken the area and this is not necessarily a bad thing but you know this is a way that nature is able to reclaim an area all right, so summing up secondary succession, take a look at this, all right? This is actually a graph that'll show you how this happens. So you'll start off with, you know, first some annual plants, some wildflowers, things like that. After a year or two, you get perennial plants, and those are plants that stick around for multiple years, they'll continue to bloom. After three to 10 years, you'll get some reasonable sized shrubs, ferns, things like that. And then over 20 years or so, you get a young pine forest. And then after about 100 to 150 years, you will have a mature forest. Now that can be mature oaks, and oaks are used for a lot of these because a lot of the original studies that were done were done on um, succession in places like New England, where oak is the dominant species. Um, or in Germany and Europe, where again, oak is gonna be your dominant species. So I'm gonna warn you right now, a lot of the stuff that you'll see, they'll say that oak forest is your mature, climax community and it completely ignores other biomes and i'm sorry for that but climax communities can happen in a lot of places oak is just the one that's used as the example because it's one of the best and one of the oldest that have been studied now that being said why don't we talk about fire for a second because right now the entire west coast of our country is on fire all right we, we can't really not talk about that um, this year, 2020, we had extremely high temperatures. We had a wet last a winter last winter again, uh, followed by a very long, dry summer. And now that we're in the fall of 2020, we've got massive wildfires. Some of them were started by nature. Others were started by people being careless with pyrotechnic devices of all things. All right. So now we've got these raging wildfires like you see here. Well, Fire isn't the end of the world. It may look like it, but even fire has a place in secondary succession. So natural fires that are caused by lightning are actually a necessary part of secondary succession in some communities. And in some climax communities, they have to happen regularly. 
So minor fires will help remove the accumulation of brush and deadwood that would otherwise contribute to major fires that burn out of control. And that's part of what we're seeing right now. This year, part of the reason why we're seeing these out of control fires is that for several years now, there has been a lot of fire suppression and there's been a buildup of all this kind of dry stuff. So guys, if you look over here, you can see that there are grasses and things like that burning. But if you look at these trees, these trees actually stand a good chance of surviving this fire. The fire may burn through and clear out all that underbrush, understory, small shrubs, grasses, that kind of stuff, dead leaf litter. Those kind of things will be burned up by this fire. But those trees, a lot of times, their first branches are far enough above the forest floor that they don't catch on fire, that they survive or only a small number of branches burn, but the top of the tree has enough moisture in it that it can survive and the bark of the tree is thick enough. Some species actually need fire. So I'm showing you pictures of pine cones after a fire. What do you see? What you might notice is that all the way over on that side, that pine cone is burned on the outside, but it's opened up completely. Immediately next to me, you can see that there's that red color inside there, even though the outside is burned. And in the middle, you see one pine cone that's all sealed up and one that's wide open. Well, that's because some species of animal depend on occasional fires that feed on the vegetation that sprouts right after the fires cleared the land because these pine cones do exactly that. Trees produce different types of pine cones and some of them only open with fire. These types of pine cones, the way that this works is the heat will actually cause that pine cone to open. And down inside those opened areas, that's where the seeds of that pine cone are. And they'll pop out when they get heated up to the right temperature and then dry after the fire. So that pine seed falls in rich soil that's now been neutral, uh, uh, now been packed full of nutrients and all of that stuff's been recycled by that fire. So that fire is like a way of the forest being reborn. It's a way for the forest to kind of press reset on itself. So even though these fires may look cataclysmic in the end of the world, there's a chance after a fire that you're gonna get this secondary succession going and you can go back to that climax community. Now that can take a long time and it's really scary to think about that it may take a whole human lifetime to gain that forest back. But this is something that nature has learned how to do and it's bigger than us in a lot of ways. Alrighty, so before I finish up, um, I wanna go ahead and I wanna take a look at a few more key roles or key niches that you'll have in any ecological system. Um, so if you remember, we talked about keystone species and we did a bunch of stuff for that. Now I wanna introduce um, another concept, actually another two concepts for this. The first one is gonna be an indicator species. And for this, what I want you to think back to is maybe like chemistry, how when you were doing certain reactions, you would use an indicator to let you know when pH or uh, something else had changed. And that's literally what an indicator does. It indicates when there has been a change in the environment. So um, here, what I've got is a series of indicator species. Now, each one of these has a different tolerance for how much pollution they can handle. Now, in this case, pollution could be uh, amount of pesticides in the water, it could be nitrate level, it could be uh, turbidity, which means how cloudy that water is. Um, it could be thermal pollution. It, this could mean a lot of different things. But in this case, what we're looking at is we're looking at a series of invertebrates. And when you start to notice that the populations of these are declining, it gives you an indication that, hey, something's going on with your water here. So the first indicator that you might have that there could be a problem with your water before you even think to do any chemical tests is, did you notice that there's no stonefly larvae in there? Because that's entirely possible that that might be the case. After that, if there's no dragonfly larvae, that might show you, hey, there's something wrong with your pond and so on and so forth. Eventually, you know, you might get to the point where there's nothing living in that waterway, at which point, you know, you've kind of missed the boat already. But this is a way that environmental scientists actually 
gauge the health of an ecosystem by looking at some key species. And these indicator species have been you know, studied and analyzed to figure out how they pertain to the health of that ecosystem. Um, sometimes these are vertebrates. So right here, this little froggy uh, right above me, that's an indicator species as well. Um, that is a specific species of frog that is found on the, um, on the East Coast. Um, their habitat can actually range all the way from, um, from New York all the way down to Florida. And these guys are a good indicator of water quality because they absorb water directly through their skin. They spend their time in streams and ponds and things like that. So if there's something wrong in that water, you're going to notice that that population disappears very rapidly and they get sick very quickly. So by monitoring these guys and making sure that you've got a healthy population of them, you can kind of gauge the health of the ecosystem. So by then making sure that that ecosystem is healthy, you then have more of those frogs. So you've got kind of a, a balancing thing you can do here by just keeping an eye on those frogs. Now, um, they're not by any means the only frogs that are used. When I was in Florida, I actually worked on a project at the Morris Bridge well field, which was a place where water was drawn out of the ground to supply drinking water to the city of Tampa. We used an indicator species as well. We actually used two. What we found was that the Pinewoods tree frog really liked it when that was a natural wetland. You had standing water on the ground, you had cypress trees and that kind of stuff. And you had um, you know, saturated sediments and ponds that were basically around year round. Uh, meanwhile, the Cuban tree frog, which was an introduced species, liked it better when it was actually a little drier, not like completely dry, but when those ponds were shallower and warmer as a result. So what we did was we captured in specialized traps that didn't hurt the animal, we captured uh, pine woods uh, tree frogs and Cuban tree frogs. We'd mark them with a little tattoo. Yeah, we actually tattooed frogs uh, with a little dye on their feet, didn't hurt them again. And we would then release them with a recording of what they were tattooed with, where, where the color and symbol was on their feet. And we would use that to figure out, you know, how many frogs there are of each species. And we, if we recaptured them, we'd know where we captured them the first time, where we got them the second time, how are they moving around. And basically what we were able to do was look at it and say, oh my gosh, we are taking way too much water out of this well field. The problem we're having here is that the Pinewoods tree frogs, their population's declining, and the invasive Cuban tree frogs, their population's going up. And this means that those wetlands are drying up so what Tampa's got to do is they've got to change how they get their fresh water. And we were able to actually convince the city of Tampa to do that. And that was a big win. And that was a really cool project. But that's how, on a very practical level, a concrete thing, this is exactly how you can use an indicator species to then affect like, meaningful change, to preserve that wetland and keep the whole area more healthy. All right? <clears throat> By keeping that wetland healthy, kept a healthy cypress forest going, um, reduced the risk of fire as well. Um, you know, wildfires go down when you've got more wetland because it's just too damp to burn. So it's a really, really, really good way of judging the health of an ecosystem. Now, um, the next one I want to talk about is a little confusing because it's very similar to a keystone species. The difference is a keystone species changes the... Um, ecosystem of an area, the biome, by playing a very key role that m controls usually some other aspect of this ecosystem. There's another way though, it's called a foundational species, and these species are ones that actually modify their biome, physically change the shape of it in some way to make that habitat a different you know, functional biome or ecosystem or, or life zone in the ocean. So I got a couple of examples for that here, and these are called foundational species. So the keystone species are up at the top, the foundational species are the supporting species that are on the bottom. But that doesn't mean that one is big and one is small. It doesn't mean that, you know, one has to be a primary producer and one has to be a top carnivore, because these can actually fit into a bunch of different places. So one of the great examples of a foundational species that is just as reliant on a keystone species goes back to that kelp. 
So yeah, the otters are the keystone species, but at the same time, the, sea kel the kelp, the giant brown kelp, is the foundational species. The otters need the kelp, but the kelp needs the otters. It's very symbiotic, it's very interconnected. So this would be a foundational species. It modifies and changes that whole habitat. It goes from being, you know, a rocky bottomed, um, you know, littoral zone, open water environment to now this lush underwater forest, basically. Another example of a foundational species, a very big species, elephants. Elephants are a foundational species. Elephants will knock down trees. As you can see in the picture that I've got right over here, you have an elephant that is pushing down a tree. And it's not doing that because it's like, oh, elephants hate trees. No, the elephant pushes down trees because they want to eat that tree. They want to literally eat the leaves off those branches. And rather than trying to reach up to the top of the branches with their trunk, they're big. It's easier for them to just knock the tree down and just eat it off the ground. Um, pick up whole branches off that and just strip them in their mouth. Elephants going to do that because that's what elephants do. But by doing that, what they do is they clear patches where grasses can grow in and then other herbivores can come in and graze. In forest environments that have elephants, especially in sub-Saharan uh, forest environments in Africa or um, Indonesian elephants in Indonesia or Indian elephants in India uh, or Southeast Asia, Elephants will occasionally knock down trees, and what this will do is allow for that succession that I just talked about to happen on a small scale, where maybe it's just one tree that falls, and then you go through a little clearing in the thick forest, and you get all of that succession to happen there, and you get nutrient cycling as a result. This is a way that an elephant is a foundational species. There's a lot of foundational species out there that play a lot of different roles, and it ranges from everything from, like I said, kelp, to certain species of grasses, certain flowers can be foundational species. Uh, beavers, beavers are a good indicator of a foundational species because they create the beaver pond, the beaver dam, and then the pond behind it, which allows for more habitats for fish and invertebrates. Um, crocodiles are foundational species because they dig you know, gullies into and channels in a wetland that allow fish to swim in and out and things like that. So foundational species are similar to keystone species in that they play a role in shaping that ecosystem, but they're also unique because they, the role that they play is more focused on changing the physical structure of it, all right? So um, guys, I want you to kind of think about that and think about how they're similar, how they're a little different. We'll cover more on this. We'll get some practice on it as well. Um, I'm gonna have something for you to practice uh, looking at succession and we'll talk about this um, in live class as well. All right, guys. Uh, well, let's just go ahead and hit a quick review and that'll be that. All right, guys. So let's summarize real quick. All right. When you have a community, all right, something can happen sometimes and wipe the whole slate clean. All right. That could be like a fire or a flood or a hurricane. And that is secondary succession on the bottom, all right? So if you look over there on the bottom, that's secondary succession. What has to happen in secondary succession is you've already got the soil in place, so the first plants are gonna be small grasses and flowers and things like that, followed by shrubs, uh, some small trees, and eventually you're gonna have a mature forest of some kind, all right? But if you are starting from scratch with blank land with nothing on it, then you're gonna have primary succession. And that's gonna be up there at the top, all right? That's gonna be when you start with bare rock, like you have a lava flow that's just exposed new land, or a glacier's come along and scraped everything away down to just bedrock, all right? Then you have to start with your pioneer species of lichens, which have to start breaking down the rock to provide the first soils so that you can then get your small plants and then eventually your grasses and then finally your shrubs and trees and lastly, big mature trees like oak or whatever, all right? And that is gonna be your succession either way. You go from having a empty area of some sort, starting with the first species that are able to exploit that open area, all right? And eventually it grows up to a full,
complete ecosystem that's going to have dominant plant species and then as a result of those dominant plant species specific animal species that will live there and thrive all right when you get to that climax community that's how things will stay until acted upon by some outside force either cleared again or you know some massive ecological change all right but generally speaking these communities will stay the same way for a long time and to put this finally in perspective if we look at the forests of the west coast that are currently experiencing wildfire they are old growth forests they have been forests for 800 years or more all right many of those trees are in that age range of five to eight hundred years in age there you go all right guys that's all for this video so there's just some quick reviews on uh, primary and secondary succession